Welcome to Bring the World Home, a production of the Returned Peace Corps Volunteers of Hawaii. My name is Doug Long. I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Swaziland, Southern Africa, from 1992 to 1993, and I'll be your host for today's program. Uh, with us today is Stephen Chang. He served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali in the years? Uh, 2002. 2002. He's told me four times already, I forgot. So. It's all right. Uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. All right. Thank you for inviting me. All right. So uh, th we've done uh, uh, several African uh, er, programs with Return Peace Corps volunteers from Africa, but you are definitely our first one from Mali. Uh, our Hawaiian islands are here, and again, uh, Mali is in the African or continent. Maybe you can point it out there. It's right here in the uh, orange, uh, one of the biggest countries in West Africa, right next to Mauritania and Niger, and uh, right above uh, Burkina Faso. Okay. So how is the climate in Mali? We are uh, right on the edge of the Sahara Desert. So in fact, uh, we're quite hot for most parts of the year. In fact, uh, three months of the year, we've got a hot season where temperatures might reach uh, 130 degrees with a possibly overnight low of uh, 100 degrees. So uh, as uh, you uh, did a business program. Yes, I did. I Maybe was you can a, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I was a business volunteer in Mali. Uh, they were recruiting business uh, volunteers to do uh, entrepreneur programs or help out at uh, saving and loans uh, organizations. Uh, and uh, I was invited there, and uh, I helped in a savings and loan association where uh, I practically managed the thing, uh, trained the employees, and. Uh, Hopefully they're they're doing well off by themselves now, and that was the uh, objective of our of our arrival yeah. um, to train them so that they could do the work by themselves. So we have a picture of what savings and loan is. Uh, yes. So um, is it that I mean is that does that picture you know hold up in Mali or you know where you were at? At the most fundamental level, you take away the computers, you take away stocks and. Um, high uh, interest rates and, and uh, a lot of other things, but uh, more at its most basic level, that's what we have at Mali. So it was a, it was a secure facility, it, it was alarmed? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no. Right. Uh, we did have a safe, which probably required a, a combination. I, it was a little black box, probably held about a thousand dollars worth of uh, Sifa, which is the Malian currency in there, uh, which was which is worth a lot of money in Mali. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't very secure, but uh, it was a it was the best building in the village. What? Uh, did people have savings accounts then? They, they came to the savings loan and they actually deposited money for, uh, for savings? Yeah, absolutely. Um, most of them didn't believe in savings, but for the ones that did, we had about a membership of 800 people. Right. Our village size was about, uh, including all the surrounding villages, probably 10,000 villagers and 800 had bank accounts. All right. So the other part of that is loans. What do people borrow money for? Uh, starting up businesses. Um, improving their businesses, trying to make it bigger, uh, buy more cattle, uh, get married. In fact, uh, we tried to discourage those kind of loans. <laughs> People wanted to borrow money to get married. Um, was that for the, um, their Lobolo or their uh, marriage fee, or was it just to, to have finances for the party? Uh, finances are for the party, right. uh, and also the dowry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, most of it just because marriage is an expensive thing to do. So, What did you do for collateral? Uh, their ducks, their cows. <laughs> uh, we we put the we put the dog down, uh, but mainly usually uh, the money they had plus uh, the amount of animals they had. Uh, yeah, really, animals. Right. Were pretty respect or people respectful about the money they borrowed? I mean, uh, they were. In fact, they were. Except uh, there was a high default rate because our interest rates were at twenty one percent. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Don't get that here, um, but. Uh, that had to exist because um, the bank didn't rely on any other types of profit methods. No stocks to rely on, no other investments. It was just basically on the loans of which the uh, savings and loan organization made its profit. So they had to set it that high and a lot of people defaulted because there was poor planning, poor execution, a lot of things go wrong. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of high, but they, they definitely respect it. So this was a, a privately funded savings and loan that it wasn't a government uh, savings and loan? It was a private thing, but it was uh, not for profit. 
right. when they were trying to help the community. Um, they weren't out there to make any money, but uh, they had to survive. They had to what pay the employees. What was the sponsorship base? Was um, it an uh, individual? No, it was a... Uh, I mean, it was, it was, it was it a church or some NGO or something like that? It was or? just an NGO. It was just an NGO, but uh, uh, because we went so much down in the hole in my last year of service, uh, the Malian government threw them a whole bunch of money to save them, and I, I think they're doing fine right now. Okay. I, I should explain NGO. Uh, NGO is non-governmental organization, so mm -hmm. uh, any work that is done, uh, you know, Christian organizations, anything, uh, that are doing assistance in developing countries are called non-governmental organizations. Yeah, or we would call them ONG for Organisation Non Governmental. You had to speak French. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a bad accent, but yeah, we had to speak French. Did you speak French before you went to Mali? I, in fact, took six years of it. Oh, so you were one of the lucky ones. You didn't start off from scratch and have to learn French in three months. Oh, but I did because I'm, uh, I'm rather stupid with languages. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, I had to learn French all over again. Yep. I, I took six years, but it was, it was worthless when I got there because you practice it in classroom and it's not like real life. Were you pretty fluent by the, you know, by the, time, the time you By the time I there? left, uh, yes, I could probably write a business proposal in French right now. Oh. So. Well, that's more than I can do in Zulu. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, you're, so you're out in, uh, this is a bush type, uh, bush area. Uh, you were in a rural community. Yes, absolutely. 4,000 people, no electricity, no running water. All right. You're a very typical um, African village that you always dream about, that you uh, see in television shows that uh, you hope is Africa. You had a picture of your house, didn't you? Yes, in fact I do. Uh, this is my house uh, with the uh, goats running right okay. out in front of it. I, I saw this picture before, and I didn't know if this was uh, actually your house or not. I, uh, I assumed it was. Uh, not uh, what were you necessarily used to here. No, no. And in fact, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a big surprise when I got to site because we go there in the middle of our training session where we have 10 weeks. When we get into country, we train at a center outside uh, where we're supposed to be. And in the middle of that, week five, we went to our site to just check it out, stay there for a week, meet people and stuff like that, and then go back. And when I got back, when I was permanently placed there, I got there, my house was painted uh, green, red, and white. <laughs> and I was like, no, this can't be. It, it originally was gray, because the cement is gray. Mm -hmm. And they painted it, and I was like, oh no, how, how, am I so gonna, how am I supposed to blend in now? This sticks out like a sore thumb. I'm not supposed to be the Malian flag. <laughs> oh, okay. So, but uh, it's a nice house, uh, two-room uh, mud hut uh, with a little layer of uh, cement to hold it still. On the outside. On the outside, yeah. yes, and uh, on the inside too. Mm. Um, so that's what I lived in. Uh, no electricity, no nothing really. Did so you'd, uh, you had this house by yourself, and you didn't, you weren't sharing with uh, anybody else then. No, in fact, uh, I was one of two people that lived by ourselves. It was right. very uncommon for that to happen. What uh, kind of roof? Tin roof. It's very loud when it rains. <laughs> it's very loud when it rains and it's very hot in the day then. Yes, very much so. That's why uh, probably uh, in the hot season it probably got up to 100 degrees. Yeah. I mentioned it before on the program that uh, you know, I don't know why they switched from the thatched roof to the you know, the tin roofs because the thatched roofs are so much cooler during the day. than. It uh, is so much cooler, but actually the tin roofs are a status symbol. If you can afford it, right. it means you're rich. So it was more for uh, power and status instead of function. Yeah. Um, that's how it worked out. All right. So uh, did you uh, get around to see uh, you know, other volunteers in your area, or were you pretty isolated? Uh, the nearest volunteer to me was two miles away. Yeah. So I saw her um, on a bi-weekly basis. She came in for market. Market was in my village. And I came out to see her on every Tuesday, because we just got together just to hang out, because we were bored out of our minds right. uh, and also to communicate in English and um, have a little piece of America back with us right. um, but yeah there are uh, volunteers next to me and all within 30 45 an hour away yeah so you had the market in your town so you were actually pretty lucky then food wise so that offset the uh, not having electricity in the water just a little bit I in fact probably had the best village in the area yeah. uh, besides having the market uh, I was also the business center for the area, so um, a very wealthy village. Um, in fact, uh, one of my bosses came in from the city to come see me to do a routine visit, and he's like, 
there are a lot of cows here. You guys must be rich. <laughs> and, and in fact, we were. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, market was great. You didn't buy any cows in here in Maui, though, huh? They wouldn't allow us to, yeah. and I wouldn't know which, which ones to pick. I, I don't know which part to slap. Yeah. Uh, but market was in fa fantastic. Uh, we probably, the population probably instantly tripled during that day. People came from as far as three hours away just to come to our market. Mm -hmm. um, weekly market, tons of people coming in, buying, selling, all sorts of stuff. But probably the most luxurious thing in my village was probably uh, cookies. <laughs> Uh, and you had cloth and your basic necessities, but cookies probably top the list. Did you cook before you went into Peace Corps? I never cooked. Uh, I came into. Oh, that's right. You said you used to weigh three hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> that's a cause of McDonald's. Uh, but uh, no, I, I came into. Peace so you had Corps. to learn fast. Actually, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I, I I ate with a family. Oh. I, I delayed my uh, my maturity by. Uh, uh, eating with a family, not not having to cook, not having to wash. I had my mom wash my clothes too. Wow. The only thing I had to wash my, was my underwear because it was taboo to give that off. Uh, yeah, but slowly over, um, when in my second year, I finally decided to learn to cook because the food got a little boring after a while. Eating millet and rice and and stuff that you're absolutely not familiar with mm -hmm. for for three meals a day is it, it gets old yeah. pretty quickly. Did uh, uh, did Peace Corps provide you with? Uh, I mean, did, did they have that set up, or did you find somebody to cook for you when you went? I uh, I got there, and there's a contact that's supposed to stick with us and guide us, and uh, he took me around to a, a few respectable families, which he thought would be suitable for me, and uh, I bonded especially well with one, and I, I said, uh, "Would you be my host family?" And they agreed. And so did you have to? Did you reimburse them, or, or uh, was that uh, part of the package? One of the things I believed, uh, some volunteers did pay them monetarily, um, pay their host families yeah. for food and for washing and stuff like that. I thought that it was, I'm not, they're my family. If they're my family, I should not be paying my mom or dad yeah. for food. Instead, I gave them gifts. Instead, I uh, paid partially for the food that we ate. So um, it worked out better that way, okay. that I wasn't, that they weren't my servants, that they instead were my family and mm -hmm. they treated me as such. So was your house uh, like in their, uh, was it a compound or was it connected to their uh, their house? Or? No, no, I was a couple of minutes away in fact. Right. I had my whole entire compound. In fact, uh, my compound in Mali is probably the biggest piece of land I'll ever, I'll ever owned. It was probably as big as a tennis court, two tennis courts. Yeah. So, I don't know, more than that. <laughs> it must have been, yeah, it was pretty huge. In fact, uh, my house was at one end of the compound. My uh, bathroom as it was at the other end. And uh, it took me a good 30 seconds or a minute to get to mm -hmm. my bathroom. The, uh, uh, what was the, uh, the typical religion of you know, the area you were in? 95% uh, of Malians are uh, Muslim. Yeah. So I learned a great deal about Islam, about the uh, rituals and traditions of Islam. I celebrated Tabaski and Ramadan the two uh, most important holidays in the Muslim culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, prayers five times a day and uh, being able to marry four wives. <laughs> yeah. uh, I did not, I, I was hoping to practice that, but yeah. <laughs> I didn't get the chance. Right. Yeah. I guess Peace Corps probably wouldn't support that too much though. Well, they probably would have disowned me. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, they, they don't. They definitely do not encourage that. They encourage you to integrate yourself into the culture, to become as much Malian as you can, yeah. so that the uh, work goes more smoothly. But uh, doing that probably goes against American legal law. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, none of that. Uh, what? How uh, did you have time off once in a while to go traveling around? Peace Corps gives you uh, 48 days doing your service uh, for vacation. So I took uh, part of that to Europe for a whole month. Oh, that's right. You told me about that. You were mm. one of those uh, guys that just didn't go hitchhiking around. I, well, yeah, well, uh, it, being in Mali for, at that point, it was probably a year in, yeah. and uh, I was tired of having no internet access, no 500 channels of TV to watch. Yeah. So I had to go to Europe 
Okay. It's, it's always been my dream ever since I started studying. Well, you French. were close. You were in North, you know, Northern Africa, so. Yeah, it was five hour, five hour flight to Paris. Yeah. So, yeah, took advantage of that. Uh, another part of my vacation went to exploring the country. Uh, in fact, at Timbuktu, if I think a lot of people have heard of that, but mm -hmm. don't realize where, don't know where it is. It's in fact in Mali. Uh, I went up there hoping there was this incredible mystery about it. In fact, there isn't. It's just desert land. But uh, we went up there, rode camels, uh, slept in the desert for a night, came back out and uh, traveled on. Did you have, you had some other activities you did with the, uh, uh, the community though to keep entertained? You told yes. me about a soccer game? Yes, in fact, uh, one of my proudest projects that I did was uh, I organized a celebrity match, in fact, between the volunteers. I got 18 other volunteers from all over the country come into my village, play against the uh, village elders, the villagers, the, the, the big guys, the big guns of the village. The elders? The elders. You guys were playing it safe? Uh, they were, if we played against the best team <laughs> <laughs> in the village, they would have whooped us. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we played against the elders, we played against the mayor, the village chief, um, everybody that everybody else respects. Um, we still lost them 1-0. Um, they are fast. <laughs> no. You still lost? We still lost. They're very fast and yeah. they're very good and they've been playing soccer for 20, 40 years. Yeah, um, yeah in fact, I, I had put an age limit. If you're not older than 55, you can't play against us. But they still beat us. That's pretty amazing. Uh, um, so besides the fun part, uh, it, was also, it also happened to be the biggest soccer match in history in that area. We, in fact, did radio ads for it. <laughs> we had pe people coming over from all over the place just to watch us. Um, and uh, we, m business part of it, we did presentations at halftime to promote uh, business savings, we, to promote uh, health issues and uh, water sanitation and agricultural issues. All right, because that was the other part of your pr uh, program. You mentioned the health issues. The other part of your program was you also did uh, HIV and uh, the AIDS uh, yeah. education. Yes. Uh, sometime in my second year, one of the health volunteers approached me and said, I got this great idea, but I, I just can't get it off its feet. So after them out, uh, we decided to do our tour of five local schools where we gave AIDS presentations mm -hmm. on transmission, on how to prevent from getting AIDS. Uh, so we did that, and along with that, we had an art contest and an uh, art exhibition to follow. We gave out prizes. Everybody came out to see that, and that was a great success. Yeah. Yeah. How, uh, what was the uh, uh, infection rate in Mali? Was it a significant problem in Mali? In fact, no, um, because we're uh, kind of isolated from the, the ocean, so we don't have much foreign traffic coming into our, into our country. So we're probably around the 10 percent, the, the teens, uh, which is not that bad, but nonetheless we... Do you think being a Muslim, or a Muslim country also affected the AIDS infection rate in Mali? I think so, because uh, women aren't allowed to do much things in a Muslim culture, so they can't go out. But it's the men that, that go out and get their second, third, and fourth wives that mm -hmm. screw up everything else. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think because Muslim naturally is conservative, so it probably uh, does help a great deal in keeping the AIDS rate at a, at a minimum. Mm -hmm. right. um, I'm skipping around here a little bit. You mentioned that uh, volunteers came in uh, yeah, for your soccer match. Yeah. Uh, so what was the transportation system like? <laughs> You know, for, uh, for them to come in from their sites, how, how far did they travel or, uh, you know, if they came in for the day to play soccer, I mean, did uh -huh. they come in the, that day and go home that night? Uh, no, I wouldn't allow them to yeah. do that. that um, some people came as from six hours away on bus, public transportation. Some people came in on their bikes because they were close enough. Most came in uh, on buses or vans. It, we happened to play it on market day, so when transportation was the best in my village. Um, so most of them came in for that day played the game, did the presentations, and then uh, after that, all 18 of us went out to a resort <laughs> to, to, to party for a couple of days, really. And, and that was close by? Uh, two hours away, I had to charter a bus for that. So yeah. Real organizer here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I like organizing, organizing these things. Um, the, uh, I think there's a, there's a position for you in the uh, Return Peace Corps group so <laughs> right here. Uh, well, the, yeah, if it has anything to do with uh, soccer matches and getting people <laughs> from all over the country to come in, I can definitely help out with that. Uh, right. But um, the resort, uh, we got up there and had, had 
two nights of incredible fun and came back and well of course everybody in the village knew I was going up there and like oh <laughs> we're called two bobs in Mali where um, it's, it's kind of derogatory but it's basically howly so uh, all the two bobs are going up to the resort you know how rich they are you know go party let's go spy on them but uh, yeah that's that's what happened all right. Was it? Uh, I mean, was it a resort? I mean, uh, 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 for uh, foreign, you know, foreign people coming into the country, or was it more for uh, local people? Uh, by Malian standards, it was definitely a resort. By American standards, it's a dump. Yeah. Um, but uh, we actually had the American ambassador to Mali come in and stay with him. It was owned. It's owned by a French uh, priest. In fact, he's been living in Mali for 55 years. So he operates that. Uh, he's got a swimming pool. It's right by the river. He's had electricity. It had electricity. Okay. In fact, he, that entire resort was self-sustainable. He had uh, renewable energy, uh, solar panels, and everything was completely by itself. So, it was, so uh, this is what the thing that puts people on the spot. You know, what you know? What did you bring back from Mali? You know, as a, you know, as an experience, or you know, to the enlightenment, or something that you really <laughs> you know, benefited from uh, from the. Uh, how, how do you refer to Mali people? Mali people, Malinese? Uh, Malians. 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 Right. Uh, what did I bring back from the Malians? Uh, I brought back experiences. I brought back a photo album full of uh, pictures to show to my friends and family. Brought back a new Stephen, uh, somebody that's more mature and more experienced and uh, has a greater grasp on world events and, and the culture around us and how to be a decent human being. Mm -hmm. Um, brought back uh, business experiences to help me in my career. Uh, brought back Mali to Hawaii, yeah. really. You know, yeah. small piece of Mali. And it sounds like you definitely feel that you, uh, you know, left an impact on the people that you were working with. Uh, you know, in uh, you know business uh, consulting, mm -hmm. and you know, so it, it sounds like uh, you believe that your trip to Mali was definitely uh, beneficial to beneficial both sides. to both parties. Uh, I've always wondered uh, whether or not they've given me more or I've given them more. And I really don't know at this point. Um, but uh, I do believe I left a pretty good impact on them. I, I made very good friends with uh, a few people. Mm -hmm. My host father and I, in fact, had a second host father. Both of them are very uh, dear to me. I had a, very, a few very good friends. Uh, did very personal business consulting there. That was my goal to do um, work one on one with people to help them out with their business problems as well as their own family problems. And uh, I think, yeah, it, my, my reach went beyond the people, my neighbors. It, mm -hmm. it definitely went beyond my village, in fact, too. All right. Great. Um, What, uh, so since you've been back, to, uh, when did you come back? I came back in uh, February. So you said you, they, they don't have internet access, they don't have uh, uh, telephones, I guess, regularly. So your uh, means of communication back to your family there is probably um, uh, pretty limited. Yeah, I, during those two years, I probably spoke to my parents about uh, five times. Um, and probably three of those times was in France <laughs> when I was in Europe. Uh, but. Uh, Email was in the cities, was available in the cities, so I would go up to the cities every two weeks. But how about now? Now, meaning? You know, now and in the future. Do you, uh, do you anticipate keeping in contact with your, oh, yeah, your absolutely. host family? Yeah. Um, I contact them through my, the volunteers that replace me that are in the area because I can email them and they can speak personally one-on-one -on -one to my family members. Okay. So that's how we keep in touch. I'd like to send some tea back to them because uh, tea is probably the national food of Mali, and they consume it uh, three times a day, five times a day, every time with prayer. Did you have cell phones in your area? No. Just checking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we, uh, one volunteer brought uh, walkie-talkies. Did not work. No. No, um, but uh, no, no cell phones, no telephones. The nearest telephone uh, was probably 45 minutes away from me. Wow. Isolated. Uh, not as much as other people, but uh, yeah, kind of. I, I liked it that way. I wanted it that way. Yeah. I would have been uh, severely disappointed if I was in a city living in an apartment with 
electricity and a telephone and uh, communications with the world. I would have been really disappointed. Yeah. But I got what I wanted. Yeah. I'm, I'm going back in to Peace Corps, and uh, uh, by the time this program airs, I'll be back in Africa. Okay. Um, but the last time I was in Africa, I was in a rural community, and I expect this time, because I'm a little bit older, I'll probably be in an urban area. You're probably more equ I'm better equipped than the younger ones to survive. Uh, maybe. I'm a survivor. So. <laughs> anyway, we're coming to the close of our program. Um, I wanted to thank you for uh, you know, coming on and you know, sharing your experiences with Molly, with uh, you know, us and the viewing audience. Um, I've never been there. I really didn't. You know, I knew Mali was in Africa, mm -hmm. but I really didn't know anything about its climate or its people. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I certainly know more about Mali uh, yeah, than I did a uh, half hour ago. I, so. I, it's probably only a seven-hour flight from where you're going to be. Not too far away. Yeah, but on, you know, flight. You know, flight and the Peace Corps service. To, you know, <laughs> don't go along. You know, probably won't uh, happen with me during oh. my couple of years. Okay. Well. It, it's always there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, thank you for uh, uh, joining us for this uh, presentation of Bringing the World Home, uh, having uh, Peace Corps volunteers share their experiences from abroad. Um, as I mentioned to Stephen, this uh, will be my last program. By the time you see this on television, I'll be serving uh, another two years with Peace Corps in Lesotho, which is in southern Africa. Uh, until next time, uh, when uh, the program is hosted by another return Peace Corps volunteer from Hawaii, I bid you aloha.